Good morning and welcome to my father's place. We have been talking about representations of the spirit, symbols of him in the word. And the first thing we talked about was the breath. And then we talked about the water, the living water. And now we're talking about the fire. But before I talk about that, I have to pray. Father, you are so kind to have brought me to yourself after I had been so far away from you, after I had been so uh, rejecting you and your son. And Lord, I know because of what you did with me that there's none who are so far away from you that they cannot come to you even today. There's none who are so far away from you even sitting in the pews of churches that they cannot finally come out of a form of religion and into the power thereof. Jesus, it is you who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that many will see the truth of that today and the purpose. Holy Spirit, I could not even understand this word without you. You know, I was just talking with Jeff about when I was taking my courses to become an ordained pastor, a reverend, that I never could have understood any of this word if it was not for you, Holy Spirit. You open it to me. I pray you would open it to the hearts and minds of many. I pray there would be ears to hear what you are saying. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. They used to call me smart when I was taking my courses, but I had no I had no light on this word until the Holy Spirit baptized, until I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. That's part of the purpose. Let's read the scripture, and then I, the Lord has many things to say. Matthew 3, verse 11. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And fire. Now, the first thing that I must say is that the Holy Spirit and fire are inseparable. You cannot have the Holy Spirit without the work of the fire. And the work of the fire will not happen until you ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want you to also notice that repentance comes first. That there is no way that someone is, who is still willfully disobeying God can also be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Repentance, that is turning away from the things that you've been chasing after, turning away from the sin in your life. That must come first. Go back to the beginning of Matthew 3 with me. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Who was John the Baptist speaking this to? The people of Judea, the people of Israel, the people who remained. The people who lived in Jerusalem and all the surrounding areas, all of what was considered Israel at that time. He was speaking to his countrymen and women. He was speaking to people who said they believed in God. He was not speaking to people who did not believe in God. 
he was not speaking to the nations around Israel. He was speaking to Israel. He was speaking to people who went to the temple and performed all the things that were required under the law. He was even speaking to people that dotted every I and crossed every T to the point where they not only tithed their money, but even their herbs. Something was wrong in their hearts. Something was wrong in their hearts. The same thing that's been wrong in every heart since Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, since he sinned. And that is a nature that goes its own way. Even though following all the form of religion, never letting God have their hearts, never asking God to take over. All of us have gone astray like sheep, everyone to his own way. That was the state of things when Isaiah received that word from the Lord from Isaiah 53. It was the reason Christ came from Isaiah 53 to give us new hearts. But we have to give our hearts to him in order for him to make them over. And that's what repentance is all about. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. I hear that all the time in the church. And yet, many of those who are even preaching that have not yet surrendered their hearts to God. I tell you, his eyes go to and fro, move to and fro across the earth to strongly support those whose hearts are what? Entirely, entirely his. What does God love? A contrite heart, one that crouches down, a heart that is humble. And that was what John was preaching. John the Baptist preached repentance, preached this changing, this, this desire to give God our hearts so we can rule and reign in them. Then we can worship in spirit and in truth. Repentance has to come first. If you look down, these were... These were people who believed in God. Verse 4, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. This is a baptism of repentance. When we are immersed in water, or sprinkled with water, that is a baptism of repentance where we are saying, God, I want you to wholly have my heart. I am turning my heart entirely to you. That's the first thing that must happen because you see the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey God. Not just with outward acts, but from the heart. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey God. And these, although they were going through the form, they did not have the power. We must worship in spirit and truth. Those are the worshipers that God is looking for. They're the ones he seeks. Why should you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Why should you be baptized? I could tell you all the great things God's going to do in you to change you and all the great things he'll do through you when your heart is entirely his and he has baptized you and cleansed you and done all the things that he will do. I can tell you all those things, but here's the bottom line. Beloved, he commands it. Do we need any other reason? Amen. Now, it is not only going through the act 
of being baptized in water, but showing the fruit of it, the turning toward God. When he's speaking to the Pharisees, who dotted every I, crossed every T, and tithed even their mint and cumin? He says this to them, verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I tell you, beloved, you have two choices. You either give your heart to God, or you are going to suffer the wrath to come. He says, Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And I often use Zacchaeus as an example. When Christ called him down out of that tree that he climbed up so he could see him, he called Zacchaeus down from that tree. And when he received Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus immediately said, I'm going to pay back everything that I ever cheated anybody out of fourfold. If I recall correctly, that was how many times more. He immediately bore fruit of repentance and he immediately was joyful. And that should come with a heart that is turning and has turned toward God. So repentance. Remember, he is addressing the religious. And I believe today there are many who are religious who do not even know what it means when their pastor says Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. They don't know how to get there. They know that gets said often, but before I knew, before the Lord began to open me up to see this, I wouldn't have understood it. A relationship with God? God to me was some guy on a throne in heaven who was not real happy. And the Holy Spirit was some sort of ethereal thing that hovered in the corner up by the ceiling in the church. That's what I saw. And I don't think I'm alone in what I saw at that time. The Holy Spirit is a he. Jesus is the baptizer. The Holy Spirit comes in and then comes the fire. Today we talk about the fire. The fire that comes after you have repented, after you have turned your heart toward God, here is the fire. That's what happened in the upper room in Acts 2. Something like something that was representing the fire of the Holy Spirit that looked sort of like flame coming on the heads of each one. Fire. Fire. What does fire do? What does fire do? It burns. The purpose of the fire that comes with the Holy Spirit that is inseparable from him is to burn off everything that is not of God that is in your heart. Once you have turned your heart to God in repentance, there needs to be a purification of your heart. That is what the Holy Spirit does. He makes your heart clean. You have no other lovers but God. He has no other competition with you. Nothing of this world competes. Your life becomes focused on God, and he becomes the center of everything. And this fire is a refiner and a purifier. Go to Malachi 3.3 3 with me, please. 
is um, the last book in the Old Testament. This speaks of Christ because it speaks of John the Baptist coming to announce him. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, 3.1, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly, suddenly, come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant whom, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? This burning is not always a pleasant event. It requires a burning off of things you may hold dear to yourself, things about yourself that you hold dear. He wants to burn off everything that is not of him. Who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. We pray in the church today, O oh Lord, come, O oh Lord, come, bring your presence. When his presence truly comes in its fullness, when his kabod, when his glory falls, nobody stands. It's impossible to stand. When his presence not just a touch of his presence, but the fullness of his presence comes. And when that happens, there's revival as a result. The church gets stirred up. The church's heart gets cleansed. Oh my goodness, all kinds of wonderful things happen. Many people come to Christ who have never set foot in a church. They make for the church. They run to the church because they see the state of their souls. Verse 3, He, Christ, will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness, so that we may present a holy and pleasing offering to the Lord. Therefore, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, one who gets on an altar and is burned but not consumed on that altar, when all that comes off is all that's unclean, all that's not of God, so that what remains is entirely devoted to him. Glory to God that he would do such a thing because there's no way in ourselves that we can possibly follow God as we ought. We are like Israel. We are like Judah from the Old Testament. We say we want to, and then we find that we can't. We are like the man in Romans 7 who agrees that God's law is good, but always disobeys it. When he purifies, when he refines, when he sees his image in you, he knows it's done. And then, then you have obeyed the command of the Lord to be filled with the Spirit. Then you are his witness here. Then you are living out what you could not possibly live out before under your own strength, by your own good choices. You could not do it. You always failed. I did. And everyone I have ever worked with did. Everyone who I have ever counseled could not hold on to good behavior. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for a heart that's his. When he's talking about having a relationship, beloved, he's talking about him dwelling and ruling and reigning in you, and then you have 24-7 connection to him that is constant. You always are hearing his voice, and you always are responding in a back and forth. 
You are always pouring out your love to him and he is always pouring it back to you. This is the relationship that everyone scratches their heads about. It happens when the refiner has come in and taken out all the impurities in your heart so that it, there is no rival for him anymore. This is his command. Wait in the city. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And when he comes, he, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes, when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Acts 1.8. I tell you, beloved, the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is so that it's undeniable that Jesus is. that Jesus came, that he died, that he rose, that he ascended, and that just as this word says, when he was glorified in heaven, he poured out the Holy Spirit in a brand new way so that we could have hearts that no longer strayed and that followed not out of duty, but out of love, even God's own love in our hearts. I tell you, you can't imagine what it feels like, but don't go after it for the feeling. Go after it because you want to be obedient to God, and he has commanded you to be filled. It is his will for you to be filled, and you will see the scripture references in my notes. The fire, what else does it do? It cleanses from Acts 15, verse 9. Go there with me. Peter is testifying about the fact that Gentiles have received the Holy Spirit in the same way the 120 Jews did in that upper room. Their first thought was that this was for them only. But God showed Peter through that vision that he had of the blanket coming down, uh, with the sheet coming down, with all the unclean things on it, that we were to no longer, the Jews were to no longer call unclean the Gentiles. And so there was a big to-do among some in the, in the infant church that this had happened. And so he explained. I'll start with verse 7. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith, cleansing their hearts because of their faith. They were, they were prepared, they were seeking. Cornelius had received the vision. Peter came, and as he began to preach, the Holy Spirit came and baptized them. And they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. But more than that, what really impressed Peter and what the Lord showed him by the Holy Spirit was that their hearts were cleansed. So that the Holy Spirit does with his fire. He also lights the way. Do you remember the pillar of fire in the Old Testament and book of Exodus? The pillar of fire. That led them. They traveled at night at times. And that pillar of fire led them. So this fire that comes in and cleanses and purifies, that is, that is 
hand in hand with the Holy Spirit will cause you to be led by the Holy Spirit. You will know your teacher. He will lead you into all truth. And he will say, this is the way. Walk in it. Even if the way looks dark to you, he will light it. He will show you where to go. He will show you what to do. And if you veer off, he will tell you the straight path to what God wants you to do. And I'm not talking about sin there. I'm talking about misunderstanding what God wants you to do. And God will send you on the right path every single time. Because your heart is entirely his. And it's been purified. So he has no rival. And he rules and he reigns. Hallelujah. You will become like the bush that Moses saw. You will become a bush that is lit by the fire of God. You will become a bush that is burning but not consumed. A bush through whom God can speak, beloved. The Holy Spirit and fire. Oh, Lord, bring the Holy Spirit and fire to your church. Lord, cause her heart to be just for you. Lord, come in your power. Come in your holiness. Step down, oh God, that we would all fall on our faces before you. Who can stand in the day of his coming? that we would all fall down under your great, weighty, majestic kabod. That we would all repent. That we would all turn away from the things our heart has chased after. That we would all turn away from our sin. That we would all turn away from our willful disobedience. Oh, in your fire and your spirit will come when that happens. Thank you, Lord. And so, there are a few things the Lord wants to say. He wants to say to you, that in the church today, we blame a lot on the devil. We say, oh, Satan's at work. My life is a mess. Satan's at work. That's why my life is a mess. Satan's at work. That's why I fell into temptation and sinned. I tell you, go to James 1 with me. We need a reality check, church. We need a reality check. He tells you this because he loves you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't correct you. Thirteen, verse one, uh, chapter one, verse thirteen. Let no one say when he is tempted, "I am being tempted by God," for God cannot be tempted by evil, and He Himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, beloved. Satan dangles a carrot, yes, but we are responsible for the mess we are in, not him. Because we went after 
his carrot because of the lust in our hearts that God would gladly take away. I'm not just talking about sexual lust. It's the, I got to have it right now. It's the my way or the highway. Those things cause us to do that. We need a heart change so that we can automatically identify when Satan is dangling a carrot and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Hallelujah. God will deliver you from your lust, beloved, when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do you not believe what Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 4? For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. These promises are given so that you may become partakers of the divine nature. That is, that rebellious nature in you. 2 Peter 1, 4, that rebellious nature in you goes and is replaced by a divine nature, by Christ's nature. His character, his fruit, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, so that by them you be, may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Every evil thing that goes on in this world is because of lustful hearts. Lustful hearts, either a lust for power, a lust for land, a lust for sex, a lust for money. All of that is what drives us. And it requires that baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire preceded by repentance. And God will deal with that lust. He will deal it a death blow. Hallelujah. You cannot have a relationship with the Lord. Do not be deceived. You cannot have a relationship with the Lord if you are willfully disobeying him. I spoke with a homosexual and his partner, and he told me, oh, yes, Lord speaks, the Lord speaks to me all the time. And I asked him if he was listening. Because the Lord would have told him, cease from your sin. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That isn't what he said he was hearing. So he deceived himself. Beloved, we deceive ourselves. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness at the same time, we lie and do not practice the truth. Turn. That's all it requires. An acknowledgement that the words that he is speaking through me today, an acknowledgement that those are true words and that the way for you to walk as Jesus commanded the church to walk is by receiving what he told them to stay in the city and wait for. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire, a sign of the Holy Spirit, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, a symbol of cleansing, purification, so that you can walk as Christ did on this earth. God would not have said it if it was not possible. With him, all things are possible. Don't just mouth the words, beloved. Don't just say, oh yes, I understand relationship. Seek God to truly understand what it is to have a relationship with him. Hear the words of the Holy Spirit today. He is your means of having uninterrupted fellowship with the Father and the Son and the rest who are filled with his Spirit. That is the richness 
and the reward in this life. And that we could even be, oh glory to God, his witnesses here to show that he is real. Hallelujah. He will refine you and purge you. He will remove the chains of sin. He says, who, he who is in a slave does not remain in the house, but he who is free remains. And the slavery is slavery to sin, beloved. Shall we continue to sin so grace may increase? God forbid. How can we, who died to sin, live in it any longer? Romans 6, 1 and 2. How can we do that if we have died to sin? And that dying to sin happens when the Holy Spirit comes in with his fire. He is here today. He is here now to work in you what only God can work. He is here to take you out of your seesaw Christianity and into a full and complete relationship with God. He is here to tell those who do not know him, who may be watching this, that he wants to have a 24-7 intimate relationship, intimate holy relationship with them, that he wants to take the mess that is their lives and clean them up on the inside, and they will be amazed at how their lives change. He will clean up the mess. He will change your heart. And he is ready to do it even now. If you have heard and if your heart has been moved, I ask you to kneel before him now as an act of humility. And I ask you to ask him, if you are already a Christian, ask him to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire so you can fully follow him, so your heart is completely his. And if you do not know him today, the first step is repentance, is turning away. It's saying, Lord, I want you to have my heart. It's saying, Lord, I want you to be my savior, Jesus. I receive what you did on the cross. When you died, then I might be forgiven. And I want to receive, O oh God, what you rose for. I want to receive what you ascended for. I want to receive what you were glorified for. I want to receive the power to live this life. He will do both in you. First comes repentance, and then comes the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. I want you to say to the Lord what in your own words you want him to do. And he will look at your heart, and if you are sincere in your seeking, he will grant it. And you will be cleansed and purified empowered and guided by a pillar of fire, even in the darkest times. Father, I thank you that you don't ask us to do anything without giving us the way to do it. That Jesus is the refiner who can do what is needed in every human heart. Jesus, I pray that many would become true witnesses of you by obeying your command and the command of the Father, the will of God, that we be filled with your Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way with these words. Let them be a double-edged sword sharper than any double-edged sword, able to penetrate even to dividing soul and spirit and joint and marrow, judging the thoughts 
and the attitudes of our hearts. Let everything be exposed that you may come in and heal us of our rebellion. Thank you, Lord. I praise your holy name. I glorify you today. You are God above all. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. You are wonderful counselor, almighty God. Let it be so. I pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen.